The subject of today's video is a disease that can not only claim your life, but robs you of your bodily autonomy. It causes spasms that can tear muscle and break bones, eventually closing your windpipe and suffocating you. There is no cure for this disease, with prevention and treating the symptoms being the only way it is conquered. In today's video, we will look at the disturbing history of tetanus. It's perhaps helpful to start with a description of what exactly tetanus is. It is caused by the Clostridium tetani bacteria. The spores of this bacteria will remain dormant in all manner of biological material for years at a time. It is commonly found in soil, rotting leaves, manure, and even saliva. Tetanus is often associated with rusty metal, as this is a common way that the bacteria can enter a person's body. The bacteria can collect on rusted metal and enter through the broken skin. It's here where it starts to germinate in the bloodstream. Usually this will be something like stepping on a rusty nail or cutting the skin on jagged rusty metal. But digging in the soil with your hands and without wearing proper gloves or even a simple splinter is enough to cause the bacteria to enter the body. As the bacteria grows and spreads in the bloodstream, it releases a toxin called tetanospasmin. This binds to and then is absorbed by the person's neural receptors. This toxin stops the release of vital compounds in the nervous system that keep the muscles from overworking, and it stops the release of compounds that allow muscles to relax. This means that the tetanus toxins will cause a patient to uncontrollably spasm or succumb to paralysis. The symptoms of tetanus will usually start to show between 4 and 20 days after infection, but typically around 10 days. Initial symptoms will be stiffness in the jaw and neck, then there will be difficulty swallowing and breathing and often a fever as the body tries to fight the infection. Eventually, the infection will reach a point where the jaw will lock in place, no longer able to open. This is what is termed locked jaw. The patient's mouth can even form into a rictus grin, locked in place in a disturbing smile. But the most disturbing symptom is arguably opisthotonus. This is an uncontrolled flexing of muscles throughout the patient's back and neck. The patient's back will bend to the point where the person is arched, with the head and balls of the feet supporting the bridge-like posture. Eventually, the closing of the windpipe or damage to the nerves that enables one to breathe will result in death, which will be the case for one in four patients. It's estimated that as many as 290,000 people each year die to tetanus. But even those who survive will be permanently altered. After the infection has been dealt with, a patient might need long-term care along with physical therapy to rebuild their damaged or wasted muscles. Damage to the nerves in the voice box can change a person's voice, and the severe spasms can even result in damage to the kidneys. There is also a level of misinformation or some confusion surrounding the tetanus bacteria. There are some who insist that because the bacteria is limited by exposure to oxygen, that oxygen in the blood or a shallow cut will render the bacteria ineffective. But it's important to remember that the spores that enter the bloodstream are incredibly hardy. They can last for years in oxygen-rich environments and can even survive some disinfectants. It's these spores entering the body and germinating that trigger the tetanus infection, not the live bacteria. There is currently no cure for tetanus. Instead, Treatment is by managing the symptoms and any complications, ideally in a hospital setting. Muscle relaxants and sedatives are key, easing the constriction and reducing potential dangerous spasms. Any damaged tissue at the site of the cut may need to be removed along with any contaminated debris that might be present. Vaccines are provided to some children along with booster shots, but it's important to remember that the bacteria cannot be eliminated from our environment. One of the first recorded descriptions of tetanus comes from the father of medicine, Hippocrates. His writings, On Wounds in the Head, lists the symptoms of the disease. Hippocrates first came into contact with a tetanus patient aboard a ship, a man who had injured himself on a rusty anchor. Hippocrates suggested to rest up and to drink wine whilst being wrapped in oil-soaked clothing. However, you might be surprised to hear that this treatment was ineffective. For a time, when doctors believed in the theory that diseases were caused by imbalances in body fluids, tetanus was thought to be caused by cold or damp air. During the 16th century, a renowned surgeon named Ambrose Parry observed that lockjaw, the term given to tetanus, 
often followed puncture wounds, especially to hands and feet. So his solution was to ensure that any wounds to hands and feet were properly cleaned, and if needed, amputated, to ensure whatever caused the lockjaw did not spread any further. One of the most famous depictions of tetanus comes from a painting by Sir Charles Bell. Bell served as a doctor during the Napoleonic Wars. During this time, he took a number of sketches. In one of his sketches, named Tetanus Following Gunshot Wounds, he sought to bring to light the consequences and injuries caused by war. Tetanus was a relatively common infection during the Napoleonic Wars, identified in around 1 in 30 battlefield injuries. But where it took hold, it was pretty much a death sentence, with tetanus accounting for around 10% of post-battle deaths. At this point, tetanus was not really understood. Some doctors believed it was caused by foul-smelling odours from the soil, whilst others believed it was caused by rotting flesh on the battlefield, releasing a deadly vapour. Amputation was often deemed the only way to prevent tetanus or lockjaw infections from taking hold by both the British and French during these wars. The breakthrough finally came in 1884 from a 22-year-old medical student named Arthur Nikolaya. Nikolaya carried out experiments where he injected mice with soil samples and reproduced tetanus symptoms. This proved that whatever caused tetanus was from the soil. From there, he was able to isolate and identify the rod-shaped bacterium responsible for tetanus. Following this discovery, research into tetanus would quickly lead to major breakthroughs. In 1890, German physiologist Emil von Behring and Japanese bacteriologist Shibasaburo wrote a joint paper detailing how they had developed a serum theory for treating tetanus. They were able to prove that the bacteria itself did not cause the illness, and that it's the toxins that's the true cause. They developed the first tetanus antitoxin serum, using horse blood to create the antibodies that neutralised the toxin. Now, you'd probably expect that during World War I, there would be high rates of tetanus. Jagged wounds caused by shrapnel and the muddy trenches ought to have caused massive casualties from tetanus. But of the 2 million injured British soldiers, less than 2,400 contracted tetanus. The low rates were due to the widespread use of the tetanus antiserum, given to patients with wounds contaminated with mud and dirt. This preventative measure saved many lives and reduced the instances of infection. Although this serum did have its limitations, if given shortly after the injury, the tetanus would likely never take hold. But if it was taken too late, the serum would have little to no effect. What's more, the serum was only offered as a temporary protection from tetanus, not a long-term immunity. Only a few years after the First World War, another breakthrough came in the creation of a tetanus vaccine that would offer long-term protection. In 1924, French veterinarian and biologist Gaston Roman developed a method to render the tetanus toxin harmless while preserving its capacity to trigger an immune response. He did this by treating the toxin with formaldehyde, creating what is called a toxoid, a detoxified toxin. This would be the first viable tetanus vaccine, and his method forms the basis for tetanus vaccines to this day. By the Second World War, the vaccine had all but eliminated tetanus for British and Allied soldiers. It now became a rare infection that could be handled, no longer a death sentence for injured soldiers. After World War II ended, governments began to focus on vaccination for all of their civilian populations. During the 1940s and 50s, developed countries started to roll out tetanus vaccines along with a booster shot every 10 years. By the 1960s, vaccinations had become standard practice in many countries. And thanks to these measures, in many countries it is nearly eliminated. For example, in the year 2019, there were only four reported cases of tetanus in Great Britain. But for many in developing countries, however, the threat of tetanus remains a real threat. Where there is limited access to vaccinations and a lack of access to the serum treatment if injured, tetanus still claims many lives. As many as 290,000 people a year still die from the disease. This is largely in sub-Saharan Africa and parts of South and Southeast Asia. One notable and tragic type of tetanus is neonatal tetanus. This is a form of the disease that affects newborn babies, usually within their first weeks of life. 
It usually occurs when the umbilical cord is cut with unclean instruments or treated with contaminated substances containing the tetanus spores. Once inside their body, the spores will act in the usual way. In newborns, the first signs are distinct, notably the inability to feed, irritability and stiffness. This then rapidly progresses to severe muscle spasms, body arching and difficulty breathing. Without treatment, the mortality rate is incredibly high, at over 90%. It's in these regions too that neonatal tetanus remains a major problem. In 2018, an estimated 25,000 newborns died from neonatal tetanus. Whilst rates are dropping, it still claims far too many lives when it is entirely preventable. Vaccine programs are being rolled out by the likes of the WHO. And for pregnant mothers, the vaccine will also offer protection for their baby providing a passive resistance to tetanus and reducing the risk of infection. As of 2023, only 11 countries have not yet eliminated neonatal tetanus, with work still ongoing. Tetanus for now remains a truly disturbing disease. The horror lays in a simple cut, leading to a terrifying paralysis and spasms that rob a person of all autonomy.